Right now, I am delighted to introduce you to Dr. Jimena de Brock, who will lead us this morning on our session to break open the literal sense of scripture. Dr. Jimena de Brock is the Assistant Professor of Sacred Scripture at St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore, Maryland. Go Orioles. <laughs> Immediately before this, Dr. de Brock was the Director of Sacramental Catechesis and Liturgy in the Archdiocese of Baltimore, where she revolutionized the Archdiocese's approach to liturgical and sacramental formation. Instead of focusing on an approach to liturgical catechesis that merely informed people about the meaning of signs, she introduced each person in the diocese to the deeper history of salvation, integral to the, to the formation of scriptural memory and in the economy of the liturgy. Dr. DeBrock is herself a master catechist and teacher and it is a delight to have her present here with us today. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm sure you you have heard the same things all the time, so um, I'll give you just a tiny little bit of, of a background so that you can see that I, um, just the strange ways in which God works to help us come to know him. So um, I grew up in a Catholic family. Uh, as a very good Catholic, I never read the Bible. <laughs> it sat on a bookshelf and it kind of collected dust. But I knew that I had to have one. Um, I never thought I would study theology, scripture. That was the last thing on my mind. My, uh, my degree when I first graduated from high school was in nursing. I did critical care nursing for 15 years. And uh, God was part of my life in a very nominal way. I was your typical nominal cultural Catholic that uh, went to mass sort of, kind of, not fully consciously, actively participated. Um, I had no idea what the narrative was. I had no idea why I was sitting at mass listening to these readings that made no sense to me. And uh, really, they were never really explained that clearly. So at some point, God decided it would be time for me to uh, to follow him in a, in a deeper way and really make a commitment to be a disciple. So long story short, um, my husband was in the military and they moved us overseas and during that time I couldn't practice nursing. So he literally had to take me out of a geographical context because I was probably too stubborn to do it any other way. And uh, little by little I, I had this thirst in me that could not be quenched with anything, and I can only say that that was the Holy Spirit. So, um, so there you go. Uh, somebody who was, I, I couldn't even say I was spiritual, you know, that's the, that's the thing that we hear today, I'm spiritual but not religious. I couldn't really say that I was even spiritual, sadly. Um, and so here we are, as, as you know, I'm teaching now at the seminary. <laughs> Is the disc work working or should we do it from here? Do it from here. Okay. So I'm, I'm teaching at the seminary and through, um, through God's incredible gift, um, I continue to learn each day from them as much as I, as much as I teach them. So. So until that gets set up, I just wanted to kind of backtrack a little bit. As you know, what we're doing this week is sacramental imagination and the senses of scripture. So before we go directly into the literal sense, what I want to backtrack a little bit is talk about sacramental imagination. What do we understand by that? And this is going to be very interactive, so I'm not here just talking at you or lecturing. I expect a lot of audience participation, so please. Uh, help me out. So what do we understand by sacramental imagination? How would you, what would you say that is? What does it look like? Because it's so easy to come up with good language and good terms and then when we go back to the parish, how do we make this happen? So 
Anybody, who, who can tell me what, when you hear sacramental imagination, what does your imagination spark you to understand? Yes? That anything of the material world can reveal God. Okay, okay. Anybody else? So it's the concept that we can say sacramentality or sacramental imagination. God imbued the world with his presence at the moment of creation. In a very particular and concrete way, his presence takes place in the incarnation. However, creation participates in God's essence in some way or another and in different degrees. So all the created order reveals God, has the potential to reveal God. With that in mind, we can think outside the seven rituals that we call sacraments, which are very important. We cannot um, undermine that by any means. And we can look at other ways that God is revealed. Thank you. For instance, yesterday we talked about scripture being a sacrament because it is revealing God. In fact, Sacrosanctum Concilium talks about four presences of God in, during Mass in the liturgy. Those presences are the consecrated species, sacred scripture, the person of the priest presiding at the liturgy, but also us, the community gathered in prayer. So we too are a sacrament. With that in mind, we can begin to look at this outline sort of for today. Talk a little bit about sacramental imagination, the senses of scripture, and the focus today, and you see that's the larger piece of that outline, is the little sense what it is, what it is not, the challenges in approaching the literal sense, and the importance, the essential aspect of understanding why we must return to the literal sense. And then we're going to talk about a few possible applications in awakening our imagination and thoughts throughout the presentation. I'm open to hearing your thoughts, your your concerns, your dreams, how we could make this happen. So let's look at these two images, first of all, as we are beginning to understand a sacramental imagination. And I know I violated a little bit the rules of PowerPoints with not having a lot of text, but I wanted to have the scripture there. So the first one, a classical, the classical painting from Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, <coughs> one of the tiles um, on the ceiling, the creation of Adam. And by the way, I do have an accent. Please try to filter it a little bit. I grew up in Ecuador, so just if you're hearing an accent, you're not imagining. It is. <laughs> so Genesis 1:26 to 27. Then God said, "Let us make human beings in our image." After our likeness, let them have dominion over the earth. God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So if a sacrament is something visible that reveals something invisible, if a sacrament is something tangible that points towards something intangible, then humanity is a form of sacrament, a type of sacrament, to use the typological words. The image on the other side is an image from a Russian Orthodox catechism. And it shows us this typology that we were talking about yesterday. And generally, you see Adam, Christ as the new Adam. And generally, we see those two. But since God created male and female, then Christ is the new Adam. And although we know Mary as the new Eve, since Eve is part of humanity, then both are recreated, recapitulated in Christ. 
Christ is the primordial sacrament. He is the image of the invisible God. Again, reminding ourselves that sacrament is something visible, something tangible that points towards something invisible. So Christ is our primordial sacrament. He is the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, things have been created through him and for him. And this kind of gives us the template for sacramental imagination. And as you said earlier, the, the potential, the potential, rea the potentiality, the potential that the entire creator order can be a type of sacrament, remembering that Christ is the primordial sacrament. Questions about this? Yes? Um, in Sophia's writing, she speaks often about the progressive incarnation, mm -hmm. and really that's what you're speaking about with sacramental imagination. I mean, it's... Right. Right? That, that, that Abs throughout. Absolutely, yes. Um, she mentions... I'm not a certified Good Shepherd Catechist, so there's a disclaimer, but I have worked closely. I have had the privilege of working closely with Good Shepherd Catechist throughout my time in pastoral ministry in parishes. So um, life happened, and so I could never get certified. But I am, you know, I, I have, in fact, I use Sofia Cavaletti's writings for my classes at the seminary. But you're right, so progressive incarnation, and in fact, um, you know, the, the idea of, even as the burning bird, every theophan in the Old Testament is anticipating the incarnation. Every theophany that we see. And I'll show you a couple of images of theophany. So thank you for mentioning that. So what we're about to undertake here is a little conversation, dialogue about sacred story, sacred history. And we're very focused and very keen on the written text, which is worthwhile. You know, we have our nice printed text, but we know that this did not drop out of the sky, bound it like this, bound like this. We know that there's an oral tradition that preceded the written text, centuries, perhaps even millennia. So, in as much as we look at the written text, I encourage you as part of developing that imagination to think of the oral tradition that predates it. And it helps us understand and it helps us navigate some of the critiques or challenges of the written text. For instance, this couldn't have been written by Moses. Jesus really did not say that. Paul wasn't the author of Colossians or Ephesians. That's a pseudo-Pauline letter. Any of those any of those arguments, although they could have some valid truth to them, we must be cognizant that a neural tradition predates. And the kernel of that message resides in the oral tradition. We as a culture in the 21st century have lost a lot of that oral transmission. Although now that we have resorted, I left my phone at the table, now that we have resorted to text, we're becoming less of a literate uh, society and a little bit of a mix. So perhaps we could come back to sharing stories. Per perhaps we could come back to that. And from that oral tradition, of course, the written text evolves in several stages. So long before we had the translations, of course, they had to be written in other, in other media, in other materials. So we have vellum, we have parchment. Um, this, this image on the far right is a book found in, in the area of Jordan that is a metal book, a book on metal sheets and of course with inscriptions. So before we could you know, fully enter into that little message, we want to kind of think back about how the written text came to be. I saw that we have the beautiful copy of Sophia's book. Before I was introduced to that book, to the new copy, this is what I first read. And this really, um, 
her way of, of explaining things kind of stole my heart. And I don't know, maybe she's praying for me so that I can learn this the right way and help explain this the right way. But I was so amazed at having this biblical scholar that could explain things in a way that were, was so accessible to someone who was a nominal Catholic, a nominal religious person. And this is the book that I read, and this is the book that I have passed out numerous times. Of course, now I can't find it anymore. I have to get the new copy. So um, she wrote it in 1967, and um, it would have been under the, the Italian title, Storia della Salvezza. And in 1999, it was translated into English. It contains much of what you see in the book that was in our bag. And I can't even tell you how this book came to, to find me, rather than me find the book. I just, one day I had it, and I cannot pinpoint how it happened, but it opened my eyes in a way that I cannot even begin to describe. So we have the senses of scripture that we began talking about yesterday. They haven't always had these, all these names, um, especially in the spiritual category, we have named them different things throughout the history of biblical interpretation. But certainly we have distinguished that there's a literal sense and a spiritual sense. And what we mean by little, little is that which has been expressed directly by the inspired human authors. And what that means is that we kind of have to get ourselves into the text at the time in which the text was written, and even before that, at the time in which the oral tradition which have, would have started that produced that little sense. And in between, we have the reception of the text. How was it received by the community for which it was being given, preached, proclaimed? And how did that community change by having received the text? And how did that reception of the text possibly affect the way the written form came to us? The spiritual sense distinguishes three layers, if you will allegorical, moral, and anagogical. The allegorical is that which is seen in fulfillment in Christ, primarily. But we also see a lot of the typological images. So places, people, and events that are foreshadowed. How are those places, people, and events being fulfilled later on? Moral, how is the text fitting and being realized in us. What is the text asking me to do? Anagogical, how will this text be seen in the eschaton? And I will give you a handout that doesn't have all of this, but some of this. So let's see if my technical abilities work here at all. They might not. Okay, I want you to try to see the image and listen. So what I would like you to do, this is, I seldom work with acronyms, but somehow this came to me. I'm using the acronym PLOP. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm asking you to pray, to listen, to observe, and to pray again as you enter the text. And I ask my students to do that. I ask myself to do that. Pray, listen, observe and pray again. And you see the ripples as we hear that plot. And hopefully those ripples will happen in our hearts. It's kind of easier for them to happen in our heads. But let's see how they happen in our hearts. So in order to consider the literal sense, we have to look at three elements. That again, we heard some of this last night. We look at history, literature, and the theology of the text itself. It's not as though the literal sense is void of theology. We make this mistake of thinking the literal sense is just a text, a Shakespearean play, void of a theological message. 
and that's not the case. The text, as it was written, has an inherent theological message. These three elements have been presented in, an, in a variety of ways as a hermeneutical circle, as a hermeneutical um, spiral, as a hermeneutical triad. I personally pre prefer the, the triangle symbol uh, or the chain linking one another because I think of that sacred history, the God of history that intervenes at every moment of history, and that particular history is narrated in literature, in some literary form, although previously transmitted orally, in all to communicate a theological message. It's not there only for us to analyze the text. It is there for us to pray, listen, observe, and pray again about what the message being conveyed is. As you can gather from this presentation, I happen to be a very visual person. If you're not a visual, if you're a different type of learner, you might have to tweak how you present this to people. But I, I play with different images to help me understand this. And this is another image that has come to, to help me understand that the literal sense encompasses all of this. So for instance, um, when my students, one of the questions in every exam will be I give them a text and I ask them to give me the literal sense of that text. And I tell them to give me the literal historical context, the literal liter literary context, and the literal theological message. Because they need to be very attuned to all those, sense, to all those elements of the literal sense. In literal sense, is not the same as literature. They start with the same letters. They have a lot of the same letters, but literature and literal are not the same thing. Questions about that? So each of these aspects, history, literature, and theology, have some elements that we must be attentive to. And for each of them, there are challenges as to how do we learn it, and how do we teach them? And how do we ponder before we can even, even teach them? And so as I present each one, I'm going to tell you some of the elements and then propose some challenges and see if you perhaps have even more challenges or ways that we can uh, address the challenges. So we have the historical context, the literal historical context. If we don't have context, we don't understand what is happening. This is an image from the St. John's Bible, which later you will get to see. Um, I don't know that you can see the writing little as it is, but any, any, and don't go on your, on your phones to look for the image, please. <laughs> it, will, it will kind of take away from the exercise. What do you think it is? It is Moses seeing the promised land. And what you can see on the margins, or not see, you'll, when you see the St. John's Bible, you'll be able to see it a little closer, is the text from Deuteronomy 34.4. The Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. Here's the punchline. <laughs> I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you shall not cross over there. What, what the heck does that mean? Where was Moses standing? Have you ever wondered about that? We are so removed from the historical context. The historical context encompasses history, geography, social circumstances, political circumstances, cultural circumstances. We are so removed from that time. What do you envision this being? If you, if you could be inside that image, what do your eyes or your heart see? What land is he seeing? What does it look like? 
What do you think? It's fruitful because it's there's grain ripening in the background. Okay. The, the image I've always had in my head since I was a little boy was was uh, him on a on a dusty barren mountain, you know, in the in the wilderness. It's almost like a desert. Yeah. And uh, looking <coughs> across the river there, and everything on the other side of the river is green and lush and and beautiful. And yeah. He's yeah. Seeing it, he's and so he's close. Seeing, and he's, he's so close, but you can't get there. Right. Maybe some of us walking this morning, we were so close that we couldn't find him. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts? How else do you see this image? And n none of them are wrong. All of us are seeing in our hearts what God wants us to see in our hearts at this time. I, I've always thought it was the Garden of Eden. Almost okay. A garden, for sure. And okay. Almost like going back to the original Going back garden. to that point. And I'm, I'm glad you bring that up. I will kind of do a little tangential comment. When Christ recapitulates humanity, in all of creation, he doesn't recapitulate it to the time of Moses, to the time of Abraham. He recapitulates to the moment of creation. Mm -hmm. That is why he is the new Adam. So sometimes you might not hear about the relationship with Adam as a covenant, but we have some intra-textual evidence in Hosea, for instance, that it was a covenant, and so the recapitulation goes back to that original moment of creation. So I'm glad you, you brought up this idea of you are envisioning already crossing to a point of restoration. Great. Yes? It makes me think of my husband not able to speak due to a stroke. It makes me think of the day where I hear his voice again. Okay. Maybe in eternity. Or, yeah. You know, yeah. I can't hear it now, but I will. So, so you're standing somewhere, yeah, yeah. So in spite of the fact that he cannot fully touch ground, kiss the ground, he is seeing this, and, and one wonders, I wonder now, not 20 years ago, what was going through Moses' head, right? Because, I mean, for how long did he have that conversation with God, that yeah. almost argument that went back and forth, they're your people, they're your people. Right. Like, uh, he had they're to not my people. That's right. They had to be tired, like, okay, there it is, you've done it. Yeah, absolutely. They're your problem, children. I'm walking away. Yeah. But he, you arrived. It's there. It's there. It's there. And how so much of that really speaks to our own ministry. We plant the seeds, we sow, well, we have the sower, but on his behalf we plant seeds. And we might just be right there, but we can't see it. And that's okay, that's okay. We need to accept that as part of our own call to share in Christ's ministry. So I had the privilege of traveling with CRS to Lebanon and Jordan just at the beginning of June to do a short Im immersion with the refugees, uh, the Syrian and the Iraqi refugees. Something that I never in my wildest dreams thought I would do. Not that I didn't want to go to Syria or Lebanon or Jordan or Jerusalem, it's just that I didn't think it would happen in my lifetime. I just did not think it was going to be possible. CRS has, um, has partnerships with different seminaries, five in all, and ours is one of them. So they invited one faculty and one seminarian to go, and off we went. Um, a total of eight seminary people, four professors, four seminarians, two CRS representatives. And on Pentecost Sunday, we celebrated Mass on, at Mount Nebo. So I can now tell you what it looks like now. I don't know what it looked like then. But this is the view from Mount Nebo. This is presumably the place where Moses would have stood. So I'm, I'm on the mountain, and right now all you can see is that barren desert. There might be a little bit of green. It, it was a very overcast day, but the Georgia River, which you cannot clearly see, kind of runs along this way. Mm -hmm. The Dead Sea is here. And 
the sea of Galilee would be somewhere up here. From this point, it's only 20 kilometers to Jordan. We could do less than a half marathon to get there. And I was so tempted to say, how about you just go on and I'll just come back in a couple of days. But that wasn't the purpose of the trip. But in all honesty, for me, the land, the geography that I saw, and I did not make it to Jerusalem, um, it definitely has already begun to change the way I read the narratives in the Old Testament. I know the seminarian that went with us from St. Mary's already said, I can't wait until I take profits next semester. Mm -hmm. So there's something that God communicated with us through this barren desert. Um, something that perhaps we couldn't understand just by reading the pages. Yes? It's a small, uh, almost, it's probably a silly question, but and I know it's just for us, but I have to ask, is that a thorn bush right there in the center of the picture? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. That is so cool. Yes. That is just a kid. And you know, so God, you know, whoever says that God is not in charge of the details, like he totally is. Mm -hmm. So even the timing, right? I could have gone after this presentation, but, mm -hmm. but uh, the trip happened before him down. Um, anyway, just so many of the things that, that, um, that I think I can attempt to explain in a different way just from that experience, from that lived experience, which is what faith is all about. So, with a literal sense, as I said, with history we consider um, geography, history, social issues, political issues, religion issues, um, any kind of anthropological issues. But now the other piece of the literal sense is the literary context. And there are three elements within, sub-elements within this element. One is the placement of the text in the canon, the genre, in the language. What do I mean by placement within the canon? When I pull a text, I don't just, I did do that with you with Deuteronomy 34, 4, and I just read you that one verse, but that would be very disingenuous. I wouldn't just like pick a text and, and tell you, okay, here it is. But since I only have, do I have more time since we started earlier or do I not? No? Sure. I still end at 11.15? No, you can end. Oh, okay, great, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have been known to go over time in class once or twice. <laughs> okay, so I can't just give you 34 for the, the authentic way to do this is to explain to you how that passage fits, first of all, in chapter 34, although chapters were not marked at the time of the original writing, but however, eventually they got marked. But more importantly, how does this passage fit within the book of Deuteronomy? How does it fit within the Pentateuch? How does it fit within the Old Testament? How does it fit within the entire salvation history? So we don't leave loose ends. We don't just like, okay, here's a passage. We see how it connects. We go back to that thread that Sophia spoke about that connects that thread of salvation. So that's the placement within the canon. It is both, and both things are considered. How does it fit literally within the canon? Why is it placed there? Why did this text happen here and not earlier in Deuteronomy? How is it fitting with the things around it? Is it consistent? Is it jarring? Is it pulling us to, to question something? The man has just been through hell, and now he can't get there. On the other hand, the man is tired. The heck with you people. I don't care if you cross, because I'm not going to cross either. How, why is it placed there? And then, as I said, it's not just the literary part, but, but the message it's trying to convey. Then we will talk about genre and language, but let me, let me move with the placement within the canon. Why is it placed there? When we begin to talk about placement in the canon, we look for overarching themes. And there are probably three big 
big, big, big overarching themes. Not to mention, obviously, God is overall <laughs> the obvious. Um, those would be covenant, relationship, liberation or exodus, and instruction or law. And I'm purposefully giving you two terms for the last two. Oftentimes we think of Torah as just law, but Torah really is instruction by derivation law. Our challenge is, do we know the story to look for the overarching themes? If we don't know the story, we're kind of a little lost. I grew up in South America. I moved here when I was 18. I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, because then you'll do the math. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when I moved here, I had not taken history of the United States or American government. And guess what? That was probably one of the first two things I had to take as a freshman. And I was so beyond lost, I couldn't even tell you. I had no idea what were the kind of recurrent themes that were happening. And that's kind of what happens here. So I would like to do a small exercise right now. And that prevented me from making another copy because I want to use texts that are used in liturgy this week, whether in Liturgy of the Hours or in, in Mass, for us to work with. So turn to page 39 the text of Daniel, the canticle that we prayed this morning, and take five minutes, I know this is crunching time, and at your tables, work, plop first on your own, and then plop together, and look what themes are you seeing there. And under covenant, I wrote a bunch more because I want to tease out some of the possibilities that fall under covenant in the list is endless. But look at the text of Daniel 3. On your own first, then with your small group. See if you pick up any word or any phrase that speaks to you of something that you conceptualize as a recurrent theme in scripture. Does that make sense? I should play some music in the background, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carolyn should play a nice hand or a chant. <laughs> I don't know, just. <laughs> the silence is kind of nice to be honest. Yeah, you're okay yeah. with the silence? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>
a circle of way. You might come up with one or 30. Would anyone like to share some of the themes they picked out and it did not have to be the ones there? Yes. Well, the first one is the covenant and mm -hmm. it was the idea that they had of the covenant that I remember in my mind that they're talking about having a, a leader that they're thinking is going to come to be a political leader as mm -hmm. opposed to a spiritual leader. So I think that that is in, the, in a section of there where they're thinking that. And there is also a theme of abandonment that they're, you know, don't abandon us mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. from right. this covenant. Don't right. And this is this is this idea of, of relationship, right? That tight knit relationship that is everlasting, mm -hmm. that uh, is not transitory, that is um, sealed with God's own word and own own promise. And right, so covenant is a theme that we see in and out, this is one of those threads that goes throughout the history of salvation. Other themes that you picked up? Yeah. Um, this idea that, that comes back over and over that uh, Israel is in the midst of trial or persecution, mm -hmm. and it's because of their sin, and mm -hmm. they recognize it's because they've been unfaithful to God or to the covenant, and calling out to God for his mercy in the midst of this trial brought on by their own sin. Great. And you actually helped unpack a couple of the things that God would go under covenant. Covenant being the big overarching theme, and under that we could consider God's faithfulness to the covenant versus the people's infidelity to the covenant. And their trials in trying to come back to fidelity. So we have fidelity to the covenant and infidelity. Yeah, that is a theme that we see forever. They're in and out of trouble, right? Forever. They can't seem to get themselves. Thankfully, we have overcome that problem. <laughs> right? <laughs> no? <laughs> oh, okay. So, kind of how much it is our own story. How much it is our own spiritual journey. Okay, any other themes that you saw in that canticle? Uh, sacrifice is a big one. Okay. Um, not sacrifice <coughs> as something onerous, but sacrifice as something that they're eager to do mm -hmm. and something they want God to accept, make our sacrifice worthy again. Yeah. Let, yeah. Allow us to sacrifice to you. Uh, we think of it often in, in terms of uh, something we've got to do, but here we're right. saying this is, this is our part of this relationship. Yeah, and absolutely. We want to do this so we can be in this relationship. And absolutely, um, I have spent the last 10 years of my life thinking about this very issue. Um, and sacrifice undoubtedly fit, fits under covenant because as you said, it's something that, that we do for the relationship. And sacrifice is something that we give. So if we can use the term gift or offering in order to celebrate the relationship, or in order to restore the relationship. So yes, you're gonna see sacrifice from the moment of creation until apocalypse. Where's the sacrifice in creation? Where's the sacrifice? Yes? I think of sacrifice in creation as some of the um, diminishment and destruction that goes on so new life over time. Okay, so so that would be kind of a, a transformation of something mm -hmm. to become something else. And even prior to that, where do you where do we see the sacrifice in creation? The very act of creation. The very act of creation sacrifice by definition is a gift. And God gives of himself. He is freely given of himself. 
as later in John 3.16, he gives his only beloved son. But he also gives of himself prior to that. Prior to the restoration, he gives simply to give. Okay, so we've seen sacrifice. We've seen, um, I think I'm going to get all your names and addresses, and you can come be guest speakers at some of my classes because you're right on. Okay, so we see fidelity and fidelity, sacrifice. What else do you see? Yes. I had fluctuating praise and confession and petition and command and petition again. And at first I didn't understand where they fit, but I suppose they'd all fit under covenant. The yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is kind of part of how do we live that relationship. Yeah, do we praise the relationship? And we should praise it. We should always begin with praise and thanksgiving. But then we also ask for forgiveness. We also pray for forgiveness. Um, anything else that, that kind of stuck out? Yes? Well, there's um, the lack of liberation, exile. Uh -huh. and, you know, we have no... <coughs> No prince, prophet, leader. I mean that that whole piece. But but I was thinking both with liberation and even with instruction that in in some ways like there were parts here where well is that instruction or is that covenant? Well, yeah. doesn't it fit? Does it doesn't the instruction come out of covenant? Doesn't the liberation come right. out of covenant? Right. And so covenant absolutely. Um, and I'm sorry I'm not calling you by names because I can't quite see the name tag. But is it Mary? Yeah. Yes. So. Um, Covenant is sort of our primary overarching theme, and when we step out of covenant, God liberates us. He provides an exodus for us, and he provides instruction for us to return to that covenant. Yes? The abundance of God's love. Okay. Especially uh, where you promise multiply like the stars of heaven and the sands of the shore. Yeah. That it's absolutely... Abundant, overflowing, kind of like that, that reading today, come to the water. It's, it's an abundance of, of love. And we see a word mercy that comes up. And probably mercy doesn't even do half justice because the Hebrew term hesed is that covenantal love that, that can't really be translated. I mean, mercy kind of does it, loyalty kind of does it, but it's that and more. And so that abundant love, that abundant love, think of um, any time we, we birth, right, whether we biologically birth or whether we spiritually birth or whether we nurture somebody into, um, into a new stage of life, and we freely do it. We don't really do it for the money or don't, we kind of need to eat, but that's, that's beyond, right? We do it because we want to love because we're imaging God. In his, in, in his love. We're not full love, we only can image that. So good, you have highlighted most of the very um, salient themes. So Daniel is not even considered a prophet in the Old Testament canon. Daniel is considered one of the writings, but it is considered a prophet in the Christian canon. And when was the text actually written? It varies in, in our scholarly um, thoughts, whether it was produced after the exile. Um, the story takes place during the exile. He's in Babylon along with his friends. So of course, the writing probably happened much later, but it's telling us of, of an experience, a lived experience during an exile. If, um, if Jessica was to decide to be very enterprising the rest of the summer and decides to write a book on the Civil War with great scholarship and it's published by December. So the copyright year would be 2017. When did the Civil War happen? 1860. Are you sure? Because the book says 2017. <laughs> Do you see the predicament when we go to when was the text written? So I return to this point that with Daniel, in with any of the writings, we look at the context. What what is the story conveying? Where did it arise from? Okay, let's move to uh, genre. We have genre or form, you know, like 
a literary form. And we distinguish different literary forms in the Old and the New Testament. Under narrative, um, most scholars would agree and call it historical narrative. And we don't understand history in the same way as when we watch a CNN documentary. We understand history as events that happened and are being told to us um, with a particular message. Although many of them are obviously historical occurrences. So we have, we have, for instance, the giving of the Ten Commandments. We have the narrative of the people being exiled. We have the narrative of the call of Abraham, the narrative of the call of Samuel. We have very narrative, very many narratives that, um, in faith, we consider them historical. We, this is one of the kind of like quicksand areas of, of considering the little text that we might pick up a commentary or we might hear in a, whether in a university, in a faith formation, whatever opportunity we might hear that, well, this was really kind of made up after the fact to explain things and, you know, a lot of the people weren't really historical figures is what I even heard in my own formation. And so Christ said, if you didn't believe Moses, you won't believe me. So was Christ lying? I mean, if Christ is talking about Moses and Abraham, I'm going to trust Christ. And I'm going to say that these people, however they looked, I really don't care how they looked, there was someone that, that was called to, to enact whatever the narrative is telling us. Some things, if they were metaphorical, obviously we understand that as in the genre, and so we understand that it is being communicated as a metaphor. So we do, we want to be careful in understanding this genre, but also looking at it from a perspective of faith. So being realistic, being authentic in what the text means, but also having kind of this, this faith um, umbrella around us. Not fideistic that we deny everything, but not the opposite extreme. Then we have the genre of prophecy, and I have chosen to put apocalyptic next to it. Apocalypsis, I think, is a type of prophecy that uses angelic mediation. Mm -hmm. And so I really consider apocalypsis a prophetic genre. What do prophets, what, are, what, are the prophetic, what is the prophetic genre about? It's not just about foretelling the future, oh, this is going to happen. The prophetic genre consists of messages, oracles of the Lord, ways of helping the people understand the signs of the times, always, always, always in the context of the covenant. At some point, in the history of the written text, the prophet himself cannot fully discern the message, and so an angelic mediation intervenes and helps the prophet discern the message in order to communicate. So there are some apocalyptic texts in the Old Testament, especially in the, Daniel is an apocalyptic text. <clears throat> we see some sections of the prophet Zechariah that also have apocalypse we see sections of the prophet Isaiah that is called the little apocalypse. Mm -hmm. So um, I consider it a subgenre or, or part of prophecy. You might see it as a separate genre. And then poetry and wisdom, which is so unique. Um, how many people here enjoy reading poetry? Or We cannot possibly <clears throat> try to communicate how beautiful you can you can articulate something in poetry, right? And I, I have translated some text here and there. I don't think I would ever, ever venture to translate poetry. I think it is extraordinarily difficult. Even for my own native Spanish, I, I can't translate poetry. I just, I am completely unable to do so. So I am marveled at trying to read some of the text in the Bible, especially the poetic text. We miss so much in the prose with a translation, but in poetry, we completely, you know, a lot of it gets, gets just lost. In the New Testament, we also have narratives. So, for instance, 
let me just backtrack for a second. In the Old Testament, the narrative you will find, a lot of the narrative is found in, in the Pentateuch. A lot of it is found in the historical books, um, in the what they're called sometimes biblical novellas <coughs> like Ruth and Esther, although they're not novellas like we know them now, but um, kind of more uh, fictional characters perhaps. Still trying to communicate the experience of the people of the time. That, that's where you would find narrative. Prophecy, obviously, in prophets, although we have sections of prophecy embedded in other, in other parts of scripture. And then poetry and wisdom in the Psalms and in the wisdom books. But we do have poetry in the prophets as well. Many of the prophets communicate in poetry, and we'll see that later. In the New Testament, we have narrative found in the Gospels and the Gospel accounts of the Gospel. So one Gospel, right? One set of good news with different accounts. So um, the Gospel accounts and Acts of the Apostles are narrative. We have parables that are found in the Gospel accounts and we have letters. And the letters have their own unique way of being written. If we just pick up a text from the middle of the letter, we're picking up the body of the letter. But the letters, as you know, have a salutation and an ending, and they're meant to be read aloud. We don't even send letters today, much less read them aloud. So that complicates how we understand the text, and of course, the apocalyptic text in the New Testament, which is Revelation. So what is our challenge? Do we understand literary forms and devices? Do we know what a metaphor is? Do we know what parallelism is? Do we know how to employ and how to tease out those devices out of a text. I don't know. What do you think? Can we, do we know literary devices now? And I don't just mean us in the room, but I mean the people whom we minister and the people whom we live with. Do we, do we as a culture in 21st century United States, which is our context, how do you think we're doing with literary forms and devices? I think that answers the question. Unless you have an, unless you're an English major or a communication major, you might not have a clue what, and I don't mean you personally, but you know the, the generic you. Uh, one of my kids has a degree in um, communication in English, and when she declared that as a major and announced it to some people, including some of my family members, the response was, doesn't she already speak English? Why does she need an English major? <laughs> so, um, and these are kind of educated people, which was interesting. So, right, your, your um, nonverbal reaction kind of addresses the problem. We really don't understand literary form and forms and devices very well. So if we're going to teach the story, how might we be creative to help our context around us to get to kind of like imagine Lego building blocks, although I don't know that we use Legos anymore, but whatever we use, we use, we use Legos, okay. But people. <laughs> what are the other ones? Lincoln Logs? Do we use Lincoln Logs? Okay. So what could be our little Lincoln Logs to help people learn? It's not, people are teachable. I was able to learn how to do a smartphone, so people are teachable. <laughs> how do we give them the language, the skills to understand literary forms? Well, you say people don't understand literary uh, genres and things like that. I think they do. I just don't think they have the words for it. Right. So you know, it's you know, if someone doesn't understand what a metaphor is, you can you can very easily to point to something that we you know just common words and phrases that we use every day. Um, and say, well, you don't literally mean that when you say that, you're, you're drawing a metaphor, and so that's what a metaphor is. And, and, uh, you bring an excellent point because the concept is probably there, but the language that we've used to communicate it has been lost. Exactly. Kind of with what has happened with the faith, right? If we say that in the creed consubstantial, do people understand that any better than one in being? Are, do, do they understand them equally well, or do they not understand either or? Because 
our faith is articulated in Greek philosophical terms. A lot of this is articulated in literary terms that we perhaps have lost. So a creative way would be to show an example that they understand the concept and tell them this is a metaphor. If we're talking about parallelism, we would show them how this could be a positive parallelism or an opposing parallelism. Even if they don't know the term, we would show them what it means and what is it trying to communicate when it does that. When it does, an, when we have an opposite parallelism, why is that, that kind of stark contrast being communicated? So there are creative ways, but that means we have to get out of our comfort zone and roll up our sleeves and be creative. And so um, I, I find that a lot of times we might want a book that tells us kind of a recipe book, do this and do that. And that is that we're robbing ourselves of our imagination by doing that. How could we be creative? How could we, you know, just because it hasn't done, been done before, let's try it this way. Maybe they will understand. So we can help, but we need to do it. However we want to do it, but we need to help people understand that this particular text is communicated in, we, we might not even use the term metaphor, but help them understand that it's not a literal literalism of what the text is communicating. Questions about that? Yes? I guess it's just a comment, and it makes me, um, <clears throat> again, so much, so grateful for um, Good Shepherd. I'm just thinking of um, the imagination that children bring. Mm -hmm. It's so rich, richer mm -hmm. than our own. And I'm thinking of a presentation on the cosmic dimension of the sign of peace mm -hmm. during the Mass. Mm -hmm. And we ask children to imagine all the people who've ever lived, all the people who will come in the future, and we're all together in this circle, passing the peace around. And there's so many places in Good Shepherd, that's just the one that just came to me, but it's just so right on. <laughs> yeah. Because that's what I'm just yeah. saying. In, in what a, you're saying, I just feel like our program is right on. The, the children, and we need to encourage that I mean, that's the beauty of, Mont of the Montessori method anyway, right? The children are, are encouraged to have, to utilize the imagination they have as opposed to, you can't do that, it's not your turn, or whatever. You know, this is not a third grade book, so you can't read it because even though you're reading a little more than a third grader, we can because you're in third grade. And sometimes we do that in the school system, we do it in the faith, we do it in conversation. How do we allow and guide without squelching their imagination. And, and the same for adults. How do we do it with adults? Prime example are teenagers. They're not 100% disconnected. They would just like us to think they are. <coughs> I, think they're, I think they're disconnected to how we want to keep saying it. So maybe we find a different way to say the same thing. Um, what about our, our older adults? What about, you know, the millennials? What about our people that are in the la later part of life that have gained a lot of wisdom and can see things in a way that perhaps we didn't think before? Mm -hmm. You had a question, Sean, or a comment. Yeah, um, we're looking at this, the literary context, um, in, with primary is right now in the English language. Do we, is there the same conflicts in, other, in the other languages as well? Yeah, so for instance, I mean, even biblical Hebrew is not modern Hebrew, the, you know, the modern Hebrew that is spoken today. But we definitely have the issue of language, even in the modern languages. I mean, I can think of so many examples in, in my own native Spanish um, that complicate matters. I mean, just to give you the word cool, for instance, in English. Right, what cool meant a while back is not necessarily what cool literally means. And we kind of, I mean, when people tell you chill out, I mean, do you go put yourself in the refrigerator? Do you <laughs> take a cold drink? What does that really mean? And so, yes, the language, it does bear a lot of context, a lot of cultural context that we need to be cognizant. And so, in some way, yeah, no, it doesn't mean we all go get scripture degrees, although I think it would be great if we did. But remember that scripture was written not for the academia, it was written 
for us to ponder God's law. So how do we invest ourselves not just in learning the story, but in communicating the story, and not as the story of an ancient tribe, but as my story. It is really different when it's my story. When I talked to mom and dad who are now in their 90s, I was just asking them to tell me about my grandmother and, and, and her mother and where they came from, and I found out that my grandmother ran away at 16. I mean, in, in the 1800s, she ran away to wow. get married. Crazy lady, right? I mean, if my 16-year-old would have run away today, I would be like, you know, panic mode. But, you know, I was interested because it's my story. Well, at some point, I realized that this was my story. So I became completely invested in it. If we look at the movie theaters, what is the new, the new one that came from, um, oh my gosh, the Rogue Nation, not Rogue Nation, the Rogue One. Rogue One, right. So the prequels, see, I'm so out of touch with, with some of the movies, but our culture still believes in narrative and wants to own that narrative. So a lot of people can tell you all the story about Star Trek, and a lot of people can tell you all the story about Wonder Woman and the Marvel Comics uh, saga. So somehow they have appropriated that story. How do we, how can we be creative so that this story can be appropriated by everyone? It's not just the property of whoever, it is, it belongs to us. It's our story, but Sean, back to your point, language is a huge issue. Yeah. And as you brought up language, language barrier, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know how this would translate to older people, mm -hmm. but, but for the little ones, indirectly, we offer them an experience of that genre, I mean, we, because we, first we tell them. Right, right. Us, but then even in the materials, you know, the narrative people, they're three-dimensional, they look like real people, yeah. the parables are flat, so even in the materials, we're making a distinct distinction among the different genre that they will come to. That they will come and, to and experience. And I just wonder, like, so how would that translate to an older mind? You know, like, is there some indirect ways that can be creatively held? Yeah, yeah, sure. You know. One way that I have toyed with, but um, one, one of the faculty members at St. Mary's actually has a, a degree in English and film theory. And I think that for our generation that is so, um, you know, movie-oriented and Netflix and, you know, that more the, the, the visual arts, there's certainly different genres in film, right? There's different genres in, in TV series. And I have toyed with the idea of, of trying to, I haven't really done much with it, but trying to, how do we kind of maybe from that angle try to explain um, a possibility. Any other thoughts, suggestions? You know, this is this is our kind of think tank. How do we? Yeah. Well, one of the ways when you go to the nursing home and they want to, you know, try to get to the people's minds, some of them who are, you know, losing their memory, they bring back the music of the time and mm. the symbols of that. Yeah. And so I think that the music is a way to, um, and we use music in Montessori mm -hmm. and a lot of the. I'm moved very much by some of the songs that the kids sing. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's a way to reach older people. That's a really good point. That is a really good point. And, and I would even say even the younger generation. Right. They're, you know, music kind of rules. The latest, the latest teen group or the latest, uh, what is it, America has talent or England has talent or something mm -hmm. like that. But that's what you. That's what you see in the nursing home. Yeah, my gosh, and, and that would have, that is kind of intergenerational, although with a different genre for each generation. But yeah, yeah. I saw that I I taught in an inner city school, and some of the teachers, especially the African American teachers, after school they constantly had on those Christian um, radio stations, and that's all they listened to all yeah. the time. And I was thinking how they're just so immersed. In those yeah, words, right, right. In right. those lyrics, they they really look. I mean, they listen to them constantly. 
And, and obviously, secret. right, music, the hymns that we sing at church are a way to communicate the story. And we have another genre of music, the praise and worship, that also is communicating the story in a different way. The chants are communicating the story in a different way. So great examples. So here we have our infamous language barrier. So we don't have a ton of people walking around speaking Biblical Hebrew, Aramaic, or Koine Greek. We just don't. So we learn it, we do our best, but the language barrier remains. So here's the, the as I see it, the reality without sugarcoating it. I mean, it's possible to learn it, but we still, for instance, with Hebrew, um, the Hebrew text that you see in here already has the vowel pointing, so it's a Masoretic text. That's not how it would have been written. It would have been written without those pointings, only the consonants. And so the same word that had three consonants could mean different things. So is it okay if I write here? Absolutely. So for example, for these three consonants, which is the, the sound, because it has the period here, or the L sound and the M sound. Those would be, that's the root word for shalom. But it could also mean shalamim, which is one of the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. which, one, which one is it? It depends on what vowel pointings I put in here. And when the text was added, the vowel pointings, it already had an interpretative dimension to it. And the vowel pointings were added precisely to help people distinguish because they had lost the ability to read that. So for example, if I write this, what does it say? How do you know that? Because of the context, because we're sitting here, right? Mm -hmm. What about if I was to write this? Also, you have a little bit of context, not a lot. So this alters how we can understand the text. And we have to be cognizant and be aware of it and trust and pray for the people who have done translations for us. <laughs> <laughs> so then we have the theological message, a blank slide. <laughs> Why is the slide blank? The theological message is all that we've talked about, considering the historical sense and the, uh, the historical context and the literary context, and the huge barrier, and that's part of, of this blank slate for us. The huge barrier that I see with it is the fact that what is, what is our sense of our faith and belief in miracles? We want to explain everything with a, in, in an empirical way. We want to explain the plagues, for instance, the plagues in, as they were leaving Egypt, as natural phenomena, which, okay, I, I could buy some of that. So who controlled the natural phenomena? But yet we, we don't go back that far. We, we, kinda, we have lost that awe and wonder that the children have in some ways, and we have lost our imagination and our belief in miracles. So what are we doing going to Mass? That's, right? I mean, that is a miracle, but if we don't believe in miracles, then we're kind of like chilling out for an hour every week. And also, part of the understanding of the theological message of challenge is our understanding of the meta-narrative. We have a pluralistic worldview, and so is there really one meta-narrative, which is salvation history, 
or is it just my own story? How does this fit in? Challenge, something to ponder. This is an illustrated manuscript of the book of Esther. It's a beautiful uh, <coughs> ancient manuscript. <coughs> if you, you can come up a little closer, but there's no vowel markings here. So this is a pre-Masoretic manuscript. And so this, I have difficulty reading without the vowel points. Actually, a lot of difficulty. I've not gotten to that point yet. I don't know if I ever will. But um, an example of something that we, you know, that people that are considering the literal text would come and perhaps study something like this. And later, I know we're going to go and look at some ancient text. So I want to show you just a couple more. Um, As I bring up these images, any questions that you have so far? Questions or thoughts? Let me just copy this over here. I don't know what happened to it. I want to project this big, uh, also from the St. John's Bible, <clears throat> and suggest that sometimes an image is particularly helpful to look at a, um, to look at a familiar story with an image that is something that is not part of our worldview. It helps us look at things that we might have missed when we see the story. This image corresponds, well, any thoughts? You might have seen the title where I pulled it, but. What, what does this look like? Okay. You're not that far off. It is, it is a moment of, of renewing the covenant, and there is a moment of darkness. But what, what this is is the theophany of Jacob and Peniel in Genesis 32. And so Jacob is a very conflicted person. We can see, I can see myself and some of his transformation. And the narrative, the Jacob cycle, invites us to enter into the whole theme of transformation. If we follow the Jacob cycle and we are attentive to the, to the theophanies, we see that it's a man that has needed transformation, and it's only possible when he is alone with God at night. Those theophanies happen at night. When he's alone without mother, without anybody else, and when he has a true encounter with God. So in scripture, we come to find a true encounter to be transformed. So um, this right here is Jacob. That would be his name. And at the top, the other writing is Israel. So when his name is changed to Israel, he is given a new identity. He comes to understand his sense of belonging and relationship in a new way. The colors, and I'm just rushing through this, but I'm just kind of to give you some perspective. We go from the dark black to the gold, which is a, a color I know in Good Shepherd. We use that color, or, or it is used, the color, to, to highlight God's presence. And we see this, how this little gold is like kind of like flowing around. It does recall an image that you're going to see also in the St. John's Bible of creation that goes from dark, from the chaos, to the fullness of creation on day seven. And so we see that transformation in the coloring as well. And the fact that even in the midst of that darkness and chaos, God is at work. 
he does have the injured thigh bone. He has a wound that remains even after the transformation. And so it is with us, right? We are transformed, but we still bear those wounds. This narrative, oftentimes, if you just <clears throat> pass it, or if you just hear the narrative, you might, um, you might just hear the narrative and it just go by, it just goes by without a lot of thought. And sometimes looking at an image and looking for a way to engage the text a little deeper helps me. Um, confession time, although I'm not looking for absolution, I'm just <laughs> confessing something. When I first saw the St. John Bible, I thought, oh my gosh, like somebody has been drinking heavily. Again. <laughs> <laughs> every time I have kind of, um, every time I have kind of said, oh, this doesn't work for me, as soon as I put my guard down and let God do what he's going to do, suddenly it becomes something that God is inviting me to, to look at. So um, I had great difficulty at first trying to engage the text through the visual image and doing what they call Visio Divina. So instead of Lexio Divina, it's Visio Divina because you do it with an aid of the image as well. And, um, you know, I found myself going back more towards doing a little more Visio. And the reason I, you know, in, in prayer and in pondering, I realized that the reason I didn't want to do it is because it took me out of my comfort zone. It made me vulnerable. And I already know this. Why do I have to learn something else? And this was teaching me that, no, I already don't know this. Mm. I think I know it, but I don't. Okay, so we're getting close to the end. I have some text for you, front and back. And um, I have um, the, one of the papers has kind of a summary of the slides, but not all of it, but some of the key points. And the other one has some text. Um, again, without using your handy phones or electronic devices, put them on airplane mode. What do you think the hex one is? <laughs> it's pretty obvious. So, Father Edison, what is text one? It's from the book of Jeremiah, mm -hmm. prophetic literature. And when might we have encountered this text? On Sunday. This was the first reading on Sunday. This was the first reading day before yesterday. Is there one more floating around? You got one in your hand. Oh, sorry. I thought you wanted the other one. I thought you wanted. Okay. So yeah, in order to understand, and Jeremiah is one of the very complicated prophetic books. It does not fall in chronological order. He is announcing the exile. He's in exile. He's coming back from exile. He's in the cistern. Well, he doesn't really come back from exile, but. Um, not from Babylon, but he is sent to Egypt, and he is, it, it's, in other words, it's difficult because of the sequential um, articulation of the message. If you're talking to somebody and they're telling you what they did in their trip, and they're jumping back and forth, at some point you get dizzy, or I do, and I tell them, stop. <laughs> Start again. <laughs> what did you do first? And I want to tell Jeremiah that because, like, I'm, where are you going? We already went there. So he is, he's a difficult text to read, but we need to understand that Jeremiah, the context of Jeremiah, so 7th century before Christ, um, announcing the exile, one of the most horrific times of the history of Israel, and yet one of the most transformative times, because it was in that darkness that they were going to encounter transformation. And so he is... He is asking or, or telling people this particular oracle and saying at the end, saying to the Lord, praise to the Lord, for he has rescued the life of the poor from the power of the wicked. So this is kind of the moment of restitution, restoration. But in order to understand that, if you have no clue they went to exile, this would be a little odd, right? Mm -hmm. Honestly. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. It was very odd for me when I was a young teenager or younger adult sitting, although I probably didn't even hear it because I disengaged as soon as I didn't know what the story was about. Okay, what about text two? <clears throat> okay. Also from this past Sunday. 
<clears throat> a letter to the Romans, and we have this this idea of the new Adam, right? And I mean, even though the words new Adam are not there, but it is showing us how the transgression and the gift, the transgression of one and the gift of the other one. But remember, gift is also sacrifice. So the sacrifice of the other one. What about text three? Genesis, and would you say this is a narrative, this is a prophetic, this is an apocalyptic, what would you say it is? Yeah. And this is Genesis 13, this would be from Mass today. And what about text 4? That's the gospel for today. And that would be the gospel <laughs> for today. And so, uh, is this a narrative? It's kind of little pithy teachings from the last part of the Sermon on the Mount. We're not hearing a recounting of an event, but we're hearing how he taught in succinct ways. The second part there, or the, the, the one with the two lines, do to others whatever you would have them do to you. This is the law and the prophets. Why is that relevant? What does that have to do with the Old Testament? <laughs> Everything, right? So why? Because the first part of the Old Testament is the Torah, the law. The second part that was that was set as a canon, that was set as inspired text, was the prophets. And at the time that Christ was in the flesh, these were the two parts of the Old Testament that had been accepted by the Jewish people as the inspired text. They still pray the Psalms. They still had some of the other books. But these were the parts that they went to. Why? Because the law gives us, or the Torah, law is probably less of a, of a good um, translation, but the, the Torah gives us the narrative. The Torah gives us the overarching way the story goes, and the prophets call the people back to relationship. So yeah, it has to do everything. The last two, what are those? Okay. So from the Book of Wisdom. The first one is actually from the Book of Sirach. And the second one is from the Book of Proverbs. So you have poetry, you have wisdom literature. They're both poems about wisdom. And because we don't have time, but hopefully you can do this on your own, maybe later today, maybe we could drink beer later and talk about <laughs> these texts, and see the movement. One of the things that I invite you to do is to see the movement in the text, whether it's narrative, whether it's poetry. It's going from this point to that point. Why? Ask questions. Let the text read you and transform you. And I think we're out of time, so.